we acknowledge that we gather for worship on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe First Nations. This territory is governed by the Upper Canada Treaties and, and is within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We live this by honoring and respecting the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, and ancestors that walked before us, their history, spirituality, and culture. We acknowledge the land on which we gather is part of the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Hello, I extend a warm welcome to each one of you for joining us at Grace United Church in Burlington. May you be uplifted and comforted by the word of God as we worship together. Remember to watch News You Can Use for information from the St. Stephen Endowment Fund. Welcome to worship for Grace United Church in Burlington for May 9th. Please see the weekly e-blast and News You Can Use video for upcoming events and updates. Today we're celebrating Christian Family Sunday and Mother's Day. So a happy Mother's Day to all mothers and grandmothers joining us for worship. As we celebrate mothers, grandmothers, and all those of every gender who nurture us, may we remember that God is a God of relationship. God seeks us out and longs for us to connect with others in all creation. Let us light our Christ candles, gathering in the light of Christ to celebrate all of the loving relationships that shape and bless our lives. Families are strange things, coming in different shapes and different sizes, made up of people sometimes by birth, sometimes by choice. At their best, families are filled with love, ready to create a safe place, ready to invite others in. We are Christ's family, sisters and brothers in Christ's love. In this time, in all times, let us rejoice in God's gifts for us. May we praise God, the source and sustainer of life, as we gather to worship. Loving God, we're thankful that we are members of a loving cosmic creator. Help us remember that we have been entrusted to one another's care. Today, as we remember and celebrate our mothers, we remember that we are one family in Christ and that through this family, we learn the gospel. Through those who have nurtured us, you have led us to affirm our worth and to accept love's gifts and challenges. Help keep us open to wonder and newness. Help us embrace sisters and brothers of different languages, cultures and creeds, different abilities and insights with whom we are called to enjoy the wonders of our earth. Indeed, we rejoice in the prayer Jesus shared praying together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. For today's time of learning, I thought we'd take some time and look around us and remember that we all have moms. That's one thing that unites all the diversity of our creation. Here's a short video celebrating the diversity of our moms. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on a telephone wire. Some just clap their hands, a pause, or anything they got now. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on a telephone wire. Some just clap their hands, a pause, or anything they got now. Listen to the top where the little bird sings And the melodies and the high notes ringing And the hood all cries over everything And the blackbird disagrees Singing in the night time, singing in the day When the little duck quacks and he's on his way And the otter hasn't got much to say And the porcupine talks to himself All God's creatures got a place in the choir Some sing low and some sing higher Some sing out loud on the telephone wire some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Dogs and the cats, they take up the middle where the honeybee hums and the cricket fiddles with the donkey prays and the bony neighs and the old grey badger sighs. Listen to the bass, it's a one on the bottom where the bullfrog croaks and the hippopotamus moans and groans with the big to do and the old cow just goes moo. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Song, a little song everywhere by the ox and the fox and the grizzly bear, the dopey alligator and the hawk above, the sly old weasel and the turtle dove. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands, a pause, or anything they got. No. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands, a pause, or anything they got. No. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone. Just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. All animals, young and old, no matter what our differences, we all are part of God's choir. We all contribute to the richness of God's world. We each have our talents, gifts, and energy that we bring. As we continue to celebrate Moms and Christian Family Sunday, let us celebrate all the voices that make up God's choir. Yeah. 
of Acts, membership in the church required prior membership in the Jewish faith. After his resurrection, Jesus told the apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In our text today, Peter embraces the Gentiles as fellow Christians, as he observes them being filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, verses 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gifts of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Faith conquers the world. First John is a pastoral letter to churches in conflict and is attributed to the disciple John, the son of Zebedee. This week's reading follows last week's teaching that God is love. This passage puts the love of God in the context of following God's commandments. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let us come before God with prayer. Most holy friend, three-personed God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, please help all families of faith learn the way of love from you. Bring us together in spirit and in action, bearing one another's burdens and sharing each other's gifts, and establishing here on earth colonies of heaven. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we pray. Amen. Once upon a time, a little girl was sitting and watching her mother doing household chores. The child suddenly noticed that her mother was getting some white hairs mixed in with her dark hair. Mommy, why are some of your hairs turning white, she asked. The mother thought for a moment and replied, Well, dear, every time you do something wrong and make me cry or unhappy, one of my hairs turns white. There was silence for quite a while. Mommy, asked the child, Then how come all of Grandma's hairs are white? And the mother had no more to say. Today is both Mother's Day and Christian Family Sunday. 
This weekend, many of us will spend time letting our moms know that they're special and that we appreciate how we added to their hair turning white. For those whose moms have passed, it's a time to reflect and remember and give thanks. It's a day to honor mothers, a day to reflect on what mothers, families, and Christian families are all about. It's through our baptism that we're called to be one very big family. All religions seem to affirm the family. And while we tend to idolize the nuclear family, Jesus was calling us to change our definition. Jesus taught that there's only one family that's eternal, inclusive, satisfying, and that's the family that he came to make us a part of, the family of God. That's the good news and the not so good news. Desmond Tutu suggested that you don't choose your family. They are God's gift to you as you are to them. So let's be a little honest here. All families are filled with blessings and challenges. We hold on the one hand the dream of how we could be and, well, the reality on the other hand. And that's the same for our families as well as our church families. Just, just about every church family has on their front lawn or door a sign that says, in some form, everyone welcome. I would suggest to you that these signs serve two purposes. First, they're an invitation to passers-by, but just as importantly, they're an ongoing challenge to congregations. It's a challenge because we want to believe we would welcome and include and love all people, regardless of skin color or ethnic origin, sexual orientation, physical ability, economic power, age, mental health, political stripe, or even faith tradition. Again, there's the dream, and then there's the reality. To be inclusive of all goes beyond greeting or tolerating to a radical openness and loving. In her book, Supernatural Christians, Sally McFaig makes a simple statement, we cannot love what we do not know. And the opposite is also true. Once we truly come to know another, it's nearly impossible not to love. So being inclusive with our love means getting to really know the other, to be fully present with them and share wholeheartedly with them. Remember back when we used to take all-inclusive holidays, maybe at a beach resort or on a cruise ship? All-inclusive meant all-inclusive. All access all the time to the beach, the pool, to the lounge chairs. All access all the time to snacks and restaurants. All access all the time to drinks and room service. And there was no charge for any of it once you paid the fee to get there. Everything else, done. All access, all the time. Why? So we could truly, wholeheartedly relax. All inclusive meant that everything's taken care of, so we don't have to worry or do a thing. We are simply able to just be, rest, relax, and get replenished. And that's what living Jesus' radical inclusivity looks like. Everyone having equal access, being able to rest, relax, and replenish in a community feeling wholly respected, honored, and cared for without reservation, concern, or fear. And the entry price? Well, it's already been covered by the grace of God. To be clear, being an inclusive church goes beyond tolerating and beyond even being friendly towards or just acknowledging the presence of someone different. Mother Teresa provides us with a lovely image of the worth of each person when she said each of us is a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who's sending a love letter to the world. We neither create the pencil nor control the writer, but our love and care and support of each other in essence keeps each pencil sharpened. That's God's dream for the church and all of creation. At the beginning of the book of Genesis, we're taught that God created us in God's image. God's own breath or spirit is in us, is breathed into us and constitutes our very being. 
In us, there's a little speck of God, a divine spark, and a godlike potential which longs to be fulfilled. Now, in the concluding book of the Bible, in Revelations, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After this I looked, and the door in heaven stood open. And that's another powerful image of the dream that God has for the kingdom of God. So from the beginning to the end, our Bible is a record of God's dream for an inclusive, loving world. And scripture records the evolving understanding of that dream. Today we live in an era of Black Lives Matters. And we live in a time where businesses and governments and organizations are trying to be more mindful of inclusion. But it all comes down to the biggest theological question there is. What does it mean for all people to be made in the image of God? We know that different groups throughout history have been told and treated as second-class human beings, or less than. For years, Genesis was used to keep women from full consideration. The New Testament was used to condone slavery. And there were places in the world where whole theologies were created to justify who's in and who's out. The early church shared that struggle. Our story from Acts of the Apostles today is the culmination of repeated shifts throughout history, resulting in Peter being inclusive of all Gentiles, as being people of God. Acts is book two of the Gospel according to Luke. Now, Luke was a storyteller who liked to highlight details that disrupt our expectations. And Luke usually casts the agents of disturbance as angels, God's messengers. Think back before Jesus' birth, when the angel appears to Mary, and the result is the disrupted life of a young woman, pregnant out of wedlock, chosen to bring God's child into the world. And again, angels appear at the time of Jesus' birth to tip off the shepherds, yet another disruption. And at the end of his life, after the crucifixion, Angels provide the ultimate disruption of expectations when the women approach the tomb and are told, Jesus is not here, he's risen. Peter, throughout Luke's gospel, has grown to become the most prominent of Jesus' disciples. In the book of Acts, he's settled into his call, continuing to teach Jesus' message of love to the people of Israel. His expectation up until this point is that he will keep the laws of Israel, eating only kosher foods and not mixing with Gentiles. Enter in the angels. In Acts 10, angels appear to a Roman army captain named Cornelius, telling him to summon Peter so that Peter can teach his household the ways of Jesus. We find Peter on a balcony praying when the angels come to him in a vision, encouraging him to broaden his diet to eat kosher foods and to go to Cornelius' house to expand the church to include Gentiles. Now think about this for a minute. Cornelius isn't just any Gentile. He's a, a Roman army officer. He's a leader in the same army that's oppressed Israel for all of Peter's life. So not only is he an enemy, but an oppressor. One who's harmed Peter's nation, his clan, his friends, his family. Once again, expectations are disrupted. Peter preaches to Cornelius' household, and as he concludes, he perceives the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And so Peter responds by baptizing the crowd and welcoming them into the church. As a person of faith in Israel, there was great precedence for this. One of the repeated themes throughout the Bible is God's nudging the faithful to err on the side of inclusion, to include people who were previously excluded, like the widows and orphans, the marginalized and the foreigners. Jesus carried on that tradition in the Gospels when he elevated the leadership and dignity of women. People who, like tax collectors, harmed others in order to benefit themselves. Jesus included. People like prostitutes who debase themselves in order to prosper or just survive. 
Jesus includes them. And perhaps the most disruptive, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, Samaritans were considered barbarian outsiders, and Jesus included them too. Jesus' ministry was one of radical inclusion, offering invitations to all without requirements or prohibitions. As a church community that has chosen inclusivity as a core value, we're called to live into Jesus' radical inclusion with wholehearted loving. And that's not an easy call. To go beyond love that is comfortable and transactional to a daring love that reaches beyond any divides and is offered freely. To live inclusively means having to think all the time about what we do and what we say, and that's hard work. Inclusivity means having no norms or assumptions about what God's image looks like. It means facing up to the times when we fail both in imagination and in action because some people didn't fit our norms or expectations. As we've journeyed through the last year, we're so much more aware that we're all part of a global village. I believe we're being called once more to open ourselves to broaden our understanding of God, our understanding of family, of who is our sister, who is our brother. The unsettling actions of God's angels and the Holy Spirit are nudging us once more to reimagine what belonging and inclusivity means and what it means to be made in the image of God. As we try to live into a radical openness and the all-inclusive love of God, may we remember that everyone welcome remains a challenge to us to genuine living and loving and that everyone we meet is a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who's sending a love letter to the world. She comes sailing on the wind that brings flashing in the sun on a journey just begun. She flies on For our time of gratitude today, 
Let us give thanks for our families and especially our mothers, both those still with us and those who have finished their pilgrimage on earth. Stitch by stitch, square by square, anyone can change the world. Row by row, quilt by quilt, lives assembled, histories built. Start with nothing, add a patch, contour, color, mix and match. Any woman, even any man, can, can change the world. Crust by crust, pie by pie, anyone can change the world. Fork by fork, taste by taste, let no apple go to waste, flour, sugar, not too much. Then we add our magic touch. Any apple in any pan can, can change the world. Penicillin. Either. Never was elected Prime Minister, so hardly anyone curses my name. But in my way, day by day, I've changed the world all the same. Quilt by quilt, pie by pie, in every word I did not say. Tear by tear, child by child, in every quarrel reconciled. Listen closely, do one's best, recognize we've all been blessed. Every morning tell oneself, today, today, I change the world. Oh, 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 oh,
Please join with me for the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, we acknowledge the gifts we offer to you, and in doing so affirm your intention to love not only in word or speech, but also in truth and action. We place all gifts in your care, trusting that you will use them for all the children of the world. Bless our gifts and bless us in the giving. Amen. And we continue with our prayers of the people. Ever creating God, we worship you in gratitude for your spirit, for the power of your word of hope that lifts our horizons beyond their present limits. You call us to be a company of believers, to be your church in the world, the living body of Christ. Help us to be fully open to your dreams for our times, to your vision for our future, that as we live in each day, we might sense the wonder of your work and see the greatness of your goodness. Gracious God, today we bring a special word of thanks for all children, young and old, who share their blessings with this family. Today, as a church, we also say a special prayer for mothers, both physical and spiritual, those women who found their way into our hearts with patient instruction, incorrigible humor, courageous concern, and gentle, comforting hugs. For all who have learned the motherly art of graceful love, we give you thanks. For the mothering of mothers, and the mothering of fathers. For the mothering of others, we give you thanks. For those who act as midwife to our hopes, for those who nurse us through our pain, for those who nurture, strengthen, and guide us, we give you thanks. For those who gently push us from the nest, for those who welcome us home, for those who become our family, for the motherhood of the church, we give you thanks. And we praise you, O oh God, for teaching us how to be good, kind, loving, and inclusive brothers and sisters to all your children. We're grateful, God, for our church family, that fellowship of believers from all walks of life, who find a unique friendship in the singing of hymns, the sharing of prayers, and the caring for those in sorrow. Today is a community we hold before you, all frontline workers, scientists, and medical folks. And we hold before you Mike and his family and Massimo and his family as both families struggle with COVID. We hold before you Richard and Jillian, Sylvia, Dawn, Jean Wong, Rachel, Janet, Barb, Chris, Rupaya, Andrew, Liz and Jordan, Juan, Philip, Suzanne, and David. Loving God, hear our concerns also as we lift them to you now. For ourselves and for those we love, we ask for life in its fullness. All these prayers we bring to you, O God, in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Remembering that Christ's love is a gift to be shared, we extinguish our Christ candles knowing that the light of Christ is spread to the world in our thoughts, words, and actions. May we take the light within to all the dark corners. And now may the God who loves as a mother loves, who cares with a father's care, who came to share our life as sister, brother, lover, friend, hold you and enfold you in mercy and in grace. May God bless us as we go in peace and as we come again in hope. And may God bless us in all times and in all places. Amen. Circle. 